<laughs> Bishop Jackson, if I could ask you, um, okay. can you please tell me what that scriptural anchor is? I'm a biblical scholar. You're a biblical scholar. I yes. guess you're going to cite Genesis 127 to 128. Now, after you're done doing that, I want yes. you to answer the following question. Why should a Muslim American, why should a Jewish, let me make it even more difficult. Why should a Catholic American, and Catholics don't live by scripture alone, as do conservative Christians, as do Protestants, excuse me. Why should a Catholic American live by an evangelical interpretation of scripture when, when Catholics can cite Augustine, Tertullian, Basil, the papal right. encyclicals, something Father Giuseppe said at mass last week. So I'd like you to answer that question for me. So the religious right, let me redefine it, includes very many Roman Catholics, but in a pluralistic society, I think we have a right to say what we want to say and the people that resonate with our value system should get involved around their shared and common values. I believe that's something everyone would agree with. So all we're saying is give us an opportunity to present to our people the things we believe and then they have been rallying without us organizing them the way you think that we have and what you're seeing is a living out of democracy at its finest levels. That's what's happening. There's no mind control here. There's no secret police that's telling us what to do. And I'm not trying to enforce my belief on people of other faith. But we do want to have an orthodoxy, if you would, to our beliefs. We are writing down an intellectual kind of framework for people who want to engage according to our worldview. And that's what, all that's happening. Isn't that all right? But what do you say to the non-believer, to the Jew, to the Catholic, to the Muslim American? To the well, we say to them, all laws are informed by somebody's morality. You have a law because it's defined moral boundaries. Someone's value system is going to affect how laws are shaped. We say stealing is wrong from several different perspectives. Uh, so I want to tell you that you're, you're really kind of fighting a straw man. I think the issue is that there's fear here. There's fear of some group controlling, and that's not really what's happening. Why can't we lift the Bible, those of us who believe in its authority, who believe that it has absolute power to change lives, why can't we lift the Bible and use it to empower our lives and declare what it says and let others in the nation choose? That's how we've been living it out. Professor, if you uh, are a student of the Bible and you're familiar with Genesis 1, God created man and woman in his image. And if you read that, uh, which every Jew believes, which every Muslim believes, which every Christian believes, therefore human life is invested with a certain dignity. From that has, flown, uh, has grown natural law over the centuries in which people have respected the dignity of created life. And that is the basis, the fundamental basis of our system of justice. I've never argued for abortion on the basis of a Bible verse. I argue on the basis of natural law and uh, the common good of people in a society, in a const free constitutional society. Well, I've never seen anybody outside of a woman's health clinic on a, mo a Saturday waving around the Constitution to justify why they're trying to stop that woman from exercising her moral conscience in that place and in that time. The people I see are the people with the Bibles. And I think to discount that as an I issue, nobody, by the way, Bishop Jackson, as you and I know, no one has ever suggested you don't have the right to say this book is everything, it is infallible, it is to be taken absolutely seriously if you believe it, and to argue about that. But the argument, for example, in that prison is why did Christians need to be subsidized in their promotion of the gospel of Jesus Christ at a time when many of the prisoners who are Muslims were getting spiritual support from people who weren't getting a dime from the that's, state of that's Iowa. A, that's a red herring. We got it because the state of Iowa wanted us to take it to do vocational training. We take it in no other states. Yeah. We We've never taken federal money. We spend $6 million a year to run these units and have gotten an 8% recidivism rate. The public's getting a good deal. The, according to UCLA, a re, uh, researcher reviewing the statistics said that you actually don't get any better a recidivism rate uh, in the argue, state have, of Texas where you have... have Reverend Lynn, let's, let's now relitigate this case. Okay. <laughs> we, uh, <Thank> agreed. <laughs>